Hi, my name is Brad, and I'm the pastor at Community Fellowship. Thank you so much for tuning in to this online gathering. What you're going to see today is people worshiping God with great music and listening to teaching from the Bible that will help them live their lives. And we're excited about the fact that you're joining with us in that. If you have any questions, please ask them. If you have statements to make, make comments. And if you think this could help people around you, share this video so that others may join us. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I'll come back and see you again in the middle and the end of the video. Good morning, community. Hope everybody had a great week. We're so excited that you're here with us this morning. If y'all would, let's stand and worship. Stop the Lord Almighty. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? The God is the Lion. The Lion of Judah, he's roaring with power, fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb.
praise this morning. He's worthy of it. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun Amen, you guys. What a good morning. You can take a break and sit for just a second if you'd like. Um, we're in a teaching series uh, called Come to Worship, where we're dealing with worship. And as I told you last week, uh, one of the downsides to being uh, Bible Belt Protestants is that sometimes from an early age, we're taught that all that uh, crazy stuff, you know, the crazy stuff the Catholics do, you know, the crazy stuff the Methodists do, uh, like this, that's bad. It's bad. And and there might be some things that aren't maybe appropriate or helpful or biblical, but the, the truth is a lot of times when you live your life scared of, of something that's different than you, uh, you, you can miss out on a lot of what is true and beautiful and good. And we recognize that the kingdom of God is a lot bigger than our kingdom. You know what I mean? It's a lot broader than our kingdom. And we look at that humbly, knowing that, that God has the power to protect his word and his people and we just want to be as obedient as we can along the way. We want to love people and teach good things. So we're learning about worship. We're learning that, as you might remember from last week, although music is a form of worship, it's really a fairly small part of what worship looks like in the life of a believer. Today we're going to learn that worship is corporate. It's something we do together. It's not something I can just stay off in my own little part of the world and decide that, you know, I'm going to worship here. It's really, it's something God intends his people to do together. And we'll talk more about that obviously later. But while we think about that thought, can I say that in our region right now, we have a, a church that is struggling this morning because a tornado took out their facility and their place of worship. So that place where they are normally together, that holy space that God has given them, uh, that, that space is in rubbles today. 
And so what I'd like for us to do is we welcome our guests, as we welcome those of you who are regulars here. Can we take a moment and just pray for Mount Zion Baptist Church and their people this morning? I love this. Um, even though their, their worship space was demolished by the, the tornado, uh, they have a smaller kind of a, you know, like a smaller facility that they use as a multi-purpose room. And their people didn't say, you know what, let's not have church Sunday. You know, let, it's, it, we don't have a building. No, they said, let's gather and let's worship. And here's my guess. My guess is today might be like a high attendance day for that church for the year. Right? Like it's the, like it's the most in... Like the most difficult time to come together, the most challenging consequences, like there's all kinds of things going on around, but the people of God want to be together with the people of God to worship God. And that's an attitude that we ought to emulate in our own life. There's so many things that can make me go, ah, I don't know if I'm going to go be with the people of God today. Let's make sure that we don't let our mind work like that, Okay. There are, there are really no reasons for us to say, I, I don't need the people of God today. Because the truth is, I don't know about you in the specifics of your life, but in my life, I need the people of God as often as I can get them. You know? Because there's something about the presence of God that comes from being in the presence of His people. And so today we are in His presence and we're in the presence of one another and let's take a moment and pray for another church like us who's handling themselves today very well in a difficult moment. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we lift up the people of Mount Zion Baptist Church in McCracken County. My guess is, Lord, that in this room there are probably people who have friends who are a part of that church, maybe co-workers who are a part of that church. In this room, Lord, there are probably people who have family in that church, neighbors, Lord, regardless of our specific connection, we know that in the cross we are connected because they are in Christ and we are in Christ. So I pray for them this morning that, that the presence of your spirit might be recognized and honored and worshiped in that place as both the one with the power to create a tornado that can destroy a facility, but also the grace of the one who would give himself for our shortcomings and sin. May this be a day of worship, Lord. And we trust you as our God. We trust you as their God. And we pray that you would be with them today in a special and spectacular way. We know, Lord, that you're the one who said that you could tear down a temple and rebuild it in three days. That's not really about a building of brick and mortar. That's about what you did through the resurrection. And we know that you are rebuilding us all the time. So let today be a day, Lord, when our trust in you is renewed. Today be a day when the obviousness of your greatness comes right before our face. We trust you with this, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand back to your feet? I know we have some folks coming in. You guys, there's some seats down front off to my right, your left. There are some seats. We want to make sure that everybody has a place to be. Let's worship the Lord today as we sing to him.
we love you, Lord. We worship you. You are our God. You alone are good. Let now your church shine as the bride that you saw in your heart as you offered up your life let now the lost be welcomed home by the saved and redeemed those
under earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stern Can be calmed and broken for my regard My eyes are on you Through it all Through it all It is well Through it all Through it all My eyes are on you And it is well With me Far be it for me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea Amen sing
my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are on you and it is well with me God just thank you for this time of worship just thank you for moving mountains for us God let it be well with our soul this morning. In Jesus' name. Y'all have a seat. Hey, man, great job, team. Uh, can I tell you that I love working with these folks? Yeah, they just really do such a good job in leading us in worship. And uh, always so serious. Always. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so uh, welcome to community today. I hope that you have a good day so far. It looks like a beautiful day outside. Um, and I'm going to tell you, this is what my day is going to end up like. Uh, I think by the end of the day, I'm going to end up in the woods with my dog and like just relaxed. And I'm going to do that. I'm not going to be watching college basketball, you know, so uh, <laughs> it's what I thought I was going to be doing today. You know, it didn't really work out like that. Um, but right now, we're going to get right down to business. So if you've got your Bible, open it up. Uh, we're going to be Hebrews 12, Romans 12. Hebrews 12, Romans 12. Go to Hebrews 12 first. Uh, obviously, it'll be on screen for you as well. But uh, if you've got your Bible on your phone, your Bible on your iPad, your Bible on your watch, if you've got really, really, really good eyes, you know, uh, Bible obviously between two pieces of former cow. Flip that open, and uh, we're going to read Romans, Romans, uh, Hebrews 12, 28. This is our theme for this series, Come to Worship. And uh, we're looking at specific wording here. He says, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Okay? And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Now, do those words scare the daylights out of you? Acceptable worship? I've spent more time in the last few weeks studying acceptable worship than I have in my entire 45-year life. I have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a doctorate all in spiritual things, and I've not spent nearly the time in my life as I have the past couple of weeks talking about or thinking about, praying about what does it mean for worship to be acceptable. And I'm really burdened by this, you guys. I'm burdened by the fact that my generation, um, we unintentionally, I think, have at times made the church worship gathering about us and our preferences and our likes and dislikes and our stylistic desires and our comfort levels. And so that now the greatest value is that we must be comfortable at church. We must be comfortable. I'm going to tell you, the closer I get to Jesus, the less comfortable I am. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't mean that I'm not uh, wanted, you know, not loved, not appreciated, not valued, but comfortable is not the right word. Not in the presence of God. Not in the presence of Him. Uh, and so that's really what we dealt with last week, kind of leading up to today. And so we dealt specifically with a lot of things about comfort and worship and how the two don't always go together. Today we're going to deal specifically with a couple of other things about worship. We want our worship to be acceptable. We come together as a church every week because we believe there's a God who created this world and that when it fell, he created a way to redeem it. And that redemptive process meant that he would sacrifice his son on an altar for your sin and mine. And we come together as a group of collectively minded, spirit-filled people every week because we want to adore him. We want to worship him. We want to thank him. We want to celebrate him. We do not come to church because we want to drink awesome coffee set in an extremely comfortable chair and have somebody tell us how awesome we are. We come to be a part of the church because we want to forget about us for a minute and focus on how awesome he is, right? And so that's what we're going to deal with today. I had a conversation this week with a person, um, and, and they don't watch live here or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not wanting to embarrass him, but they're from out of town. You don't know them. 
Uh, but this person was kind of fed up with church. Uh, by, have you ever met anybody fed up with church? You live in Kentucky, right? Of course you have fed up, you've met people fed up with church. He was fed up with church, and his stance, his product, his idea was, I don't need the church to worship God. I, I can worship God from the comforts of my own recliner. He's like, I got, I got, if I want to watch a Calvinist preacher, that's ch- channel 27. You know, if I want to watch a, you know, a evangelical preacher, it's channel 29. If I want to watch a screamer, it's channel 31. I want to watch a pastor who's going to tell me how amazing I is. That's the guy in Texas. Like, if I'm going to tell, like, I'm going to just, like, like, I guess, like, I could go to whatever I want, whatever kind of church I want, I can do that right for my own recliner. And he's like, I got Netflix, man. You can just watch, I can watch all kinds of Christian movies, and I can listen to Caleb, and I can worship the Lord. I do not need the church to worship. I've heard this same story from other perspectives, you know, like, man, the most worshipful place in the world is in a bass boat on Kentucky Lake at the break of daylight on a Sunday morning, right? I've heard folks maybe in this church say that, you know, like, that's a very worshipful. They're like, I love Julie singing and all, but I mean, that sunrise is pretty amazing. You know, it's pretty awesome. Like, I I don't need the church uh, to worship. This perspective is prevalent, especially in a world of technology where you can watch from, the, from your phone, like the best sermons around the world. You can listen to the best bands. You can, you can do all of those things right from your iPhone or uh, whatever lesser phone you have. Like you can, that was a joke from an Apple guy, but you can, you know, you can do that. Um, uh, you can do that. So why do we need this? Like, why do we need the church? Especially if being a part of the church means you have to put up with people. And do you guys get, like, if you work with people, you know, like, I love you, but people can be, you're laughing, that means you understand what I'm not saying, right? Like, like I love you, but people can be challenging. They can need redemption. That's what it is. People can need redemption. Uh, and so if we, could, if we can have all that God has for us in the church without the church, man, why not do that? That's what my, my guy I was talking to, that's what he, was, that's what he was saying. And it really, really caused me to struggle. And I, and I spent some time this week really trying to help him and trying to think through my own life. And Because here I am telling him he needs the church. Like, man, I love you, but you need the church. Your recliner is not as good as a mahogany pew. Like, you need the church. Your recliner is not as good as the red stackables. Like, you need the church. And he's like, well, why? Tell me why. Tell me why I need the church. And so... I spent a great deal of my sermon prep time this week answering his question, and that's for you today. Um, I want to talk to you about the difference between private adoration and corporate worship, because they are not the same thing. Of course, of course, you can be in a bass boat on Kentucky Lake, and the sun can break over top of the distant trees, and there's something majestic about that. Of course there is. For me, honestly, that's not my, I, I like to be asleep at that time of day. For me, for me, it's 9.30 at night. It's very dark. The stars are all out. I've got a hoot owl in one direction and a coon hound in the other. Like I am, that is majestic. I love it. I've sat down on hollow logs and talked to like God about the things I was going through and, and dealt with like that's a majestic, personal, private adoration moment. But let me be clear. As the Bible defines worship, worship is not what I'm doing at that moment. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm praying. I might even be singing. I, I'm thinking. I might be meditating in the sense that I'm considering his word. All of those things are, are good. All of those things are valuable. But when the, when the Bible challenges me to be a part of a people of God with whom I can worship, I want you to understand that what I'm doing in the woods with the stars and the hoot owl and the calm of the night, all of those things do not count for what God is calling me to do when it comes to worshiping with the people of God. There's a big difference between private adoration and corporate worship. Let me give you a little background on what I mean. You guys know that when we talk about the Bible, you're not talking about one book, you're talking about 66 books, and it's divided into two primary segments. We refer to them as the Hebrew Scriptures or the Old Testament and the New Testament, the New Covenant, right? It's broken right there between Malachi and Matthew, all right? And in the Old Testament, let me tell you a little bit of something about the way God deals with worship. Uh, The Old Testament is divided into three major segments itself, the law, the prophets, and the writings, 
Now, they're not quite, as you read in your Old Testament, they're not quite in chronological order. In fact, most scholars would say that the very last book to be written was First and Second Chronicles, which if you flip through your Bible, you'll find they're toward the first half. Uh, but, but in the long run, actually were written late. If you read the difference between what was written very early in the Old Testament and what was written very late, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find that the law has a tendency to focus on the individual. Like, thou shalt not. Thou is you. Individual person. Thou shalt not steal, kill. Like those covet, right? Those it's very, very focused on the individual. But over time, what you'll see is that God begins to speak through prophets to the crowds. And all of a sudden now, the word of God is not spoken just to individuals, but the word of God is spoken to groups and assemblies. And with King David, for instance, we see uh, out, of, out of 1 Chronicles, King David in 1 Chronicles 29, 20 through 22, it's a couple slides down, says this, Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers. And they bowed their heads and they paid homage to the Lord and to the king. And they offered sacrifices to the Lord. And on the next day, they offered burnt offerings to the Lord. A thousand bulls, thousand rams, thousand lambs with their drink offerings and their sacrifices in abundance of all Israel. And they ate and they drank before the Lord on that day with great gladness. If I could help you get one thing today as we start off this, it's that I want to make sure we all get that worship is primarily, according to the Bible, worship is primarily group activity. It's what happens when the people of God focus their love and attention on God. It's not really something that I get to just kind of put in my pocket and take off by myself. I'm not saying that when you're driving down the road in your car by yourself and that certain song comes on Caleb and you're just belting it out of key and out of tune, like having a blast, that God is not honored and loved. I, I don't mean that. It's a great thing. Do that. Okay? But anytime you see the challenges of Scripture to call you to worship, you're going to find that it almost always means a collective you, which means us together. I'll give you a couple of examples of what I'm saying so that you don't have to just trust me. Uh, some, some folks have said, well, now, Brad, there's this, there's this theology called the, the priesthood of the believer. Have you heard of that before? The priesthood of the believer means I can be by myself and still be with God. No, that is actually not what the priesthood of the believer means. The priesthood of the believer means that you don't have to go through a priest to get to God, which does two things. It, it ultimately means that every individual has direct access to God without ecclesiastical mediation. In other words, you don't have to come to me so that God hears your prayer, right? And each individual, get this, shares the responsibility of ministering to other members of the community of believers. Priesthood of the believer does not mean that you can just ignore all other Christians and it just be about you and Jesus the rest of your life. That's malarkey. And that's not true, not biblical, not helpful. Uh, if you're listening to this online, all by yourself at home, I love you. But what you're experiencing today is a good thing, but it's not church. It's not the same thing. You can access God without another person there to help you. But what God's going to do is call you to find another person and help them. You see what I'm saying? Like over and over and over, the things that God is teaching us are things that affect the way we interact with other people, the way we treat other people. How can you say, I'm a loving person if you go, I'm never around people? I'll tell you what, it's pretty easy to think of yourself as a loving person if you're never around people. You see what I'm saying? Like, no, it's, you know, like I love dogs. I've never touched one. I don't want to be around one, but I love dogs. No. Like that, that, you can't say that about yourself. So the priest or the believer is saying that because of what Jesus did on the cross, that I now have access to confess my sins to God and hear God's calling in my life so that I can now go be priestly in the life of other people. It's my calling from God, your calling from God. Guess what you can't do? You can't say the Lord would never call me to do that because I'm not a pastor. The Lord would never call me to do that because I've not been ordained. The Lord would never call me to do that because I didn't go to seminary. The Lord would never call me to do that because I'm not on staff at a church. The Lord would never call me to do that because, because guess what, folks? The Lord will call you to do things that take you out of your comfort zone, like we talked last week, and call you to interact with and care for and help people. So that's ultimately how he's using your worship so let me, I mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll prove it to you. Uh, John 4, 22, 
you know this story very well. Jesus is speaking with the woman in Samaria. Uh, she says, you worship what you do not know. I'm sorry, Jesus says to her, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers, is that singular or plural? It's plural. It's not just plural, but it's together, okay? So the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people that's plural or singular. Plural, like people, like, like, like uh, I know that, it, like not persons, but people uh, to worship him. God is spirit, and those together who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The English translation is a little bit weak at times, but this entire story is where a Samaritan woman goes, we all worship here, and you all worship there. Where am I supposed to worship? And he ultimately goes, it's not nearly where you're at that matters, but it's who you're with and how you're thinking that matters in spirit and in truth. This is not about an individual off by myself with the right attitude and the right heart. This is about us together in a way that we're worshiping together and treating God together and thinking of God together. I'll give you even more proof of what I'm telling you today. Matthew 16, 18, one of the most famous New Testament texts of all, Jesus speaking to his disciples and specifically to Simon Peter. He says, I tell you, you are Peter. Petros, right? And on this rock, Petra, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word church is ecclesia. I think that's one of the coolest church names, by the way. Like if I was starting a brand new church, I might call it the ecclesia. I just think people would go, what the heck does that mean? And you could say it just means church, man. Uh, it means assembly, group gathering. Here's, here's what, see, Jesus literally launches an assembly of people. He literally launches a group of people. He launches a bunch of people. He, he's not saying, upon Simon Peter, I will build an eternal list of individuals. He's saying, upon Peter and his faith and what we've just witnessed in the story, I will build the crowd that together will honor and glorify me and will perform my functions, my callings, everything that I want done in the world. They, as a group, the ecclesia, will do it together to honor me. That's what Jesus is ultimately saying. You see, folks, the first thing we need to know about acceptable worship is that it is primarily a group activity. The second thing you need to know today about worship, and I know I'm kind of walking through this, quickly, but, but I, I want to help you get a lot of stuff today, is that worship is work. I almost said worship is active. Like worship is not passive, okay? Wor worship is movement. In fact, let me be clear. It is more about what you are doing and less about how you are feeling. It's more about what you're doing and less about how you're feeling. I know this is going to stump a lot of folks because many of you have been raised in a culture where you thought worship was just about how you felt. And so we go like we're at a church service and the song is awesome and the music is rocking. And all of a sudden we'll get like Holy Spirit goosebumps, right? We get all kinds of excited about the way we feel. And there's not, that's not bad. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I want you to understand something. Get this. Holy Spirit goosebumps in the middle of a great song is God motivating you to worship. It is not in and of itself worship. God is filling you. God is marking and making his presence known. And I guarantee you, God is calling you to act. It might be that he's calling you to act in confession of your own sin. It might be that he's calling you to act in caring for another person. It might be that God's calling you to act to sign up for some responsibility and say, put it on my shoulders, I will take care of it. It might be that God is calling you to act by going to your next door neighbor or your brother or your uh, coworker who doesn't know him and share the gospel. But God is not just filling you with a feeling and then calling that acceptable worship. God is filling you with a feeling so that you can go do something that brings him glory and honor. So this is where it gets mixed up. We talk about grace all the time. 
Grace is the, the biggest concept in the Bible, like the most valuable, most important concept that you might find in relationship between God and men and women, but the goal is that it is that grace gives you the ability to worship. Grace gives you the ability to have faith. Grace gives you the ability to respond, but that does not mean grace nullifies the need. You see, me worshiping, me having faith, me responding to God doesn't get me to heaven. Grace gets me to heaven. But for the rest of my life, grace has freed me and you from the chains of sin so that now in our freedom, we can act. We can worship Him. We can do something about it. Not to earn His love, but because we've already got it. Am I making sense? So that's the introduction. Now we're to the main point of the day, okay? Uh, Romans chapter 12. In the, in the book of Romans, you guys know it's probably my favorite New Testament book. In the book of Romans, Paul is writing to former Jewish Christians who live in Rome, which is the most Gentile place on the planet. So their entire world has been rocked. They went from being nice little Jewish people, surrounded by other Jewish people, to changing their faith in that they now trust in Jesus for their, for their salvation. They're not trusting the law, but they're trusting the grace of God. And they've now been moved by the great dispersion into another country where they're living around people who do not know their Judaism and do not know their Christianity. Like they're living around people who are pagans. And, and Paul writes this book to them to try to help them deal with it. He says, I, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which by the way is the biggest oxymoron in the Bible. If you'll think for a moment, a living sacrifice. It's literally, you you are to be a living dead thing. That's what he's saying. You are to be a living dead thing, okay? Living sacrifice. We'll talk about that. Uh, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. There's that word again. There's that scary word again, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable. There it is again, and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Prof- uh, let us use them. Uh, and then he goes, if your gift is prophecy, then in proportion to your faith, right? If your gift is service, then in serving. If you're one who teaches, then teach. The one who exhorts, then in his exhortation. The one who contributes, then be generous. The one who leads, then lead with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy, does so with cheerfulness. And then, so ultimately I ask this first question, what is a living sacrifice? You see, sacrifice once required death because sin had not yet been dealt with. And so in the Old Testament, you'll find that all sacrifices were the killing of something for the sake of buying time for the sake of covering up sin, awaiting the one death, the one sacrifice who would ultimately wash away sins for eternity. Ultimately, sacrifice needed to be uh, death at that time because the wages of sin is death, right? But Jesus paid for our sin. And his death is equal to our death. Therefore, his sacrifice is the last sacrifice that has to be a death sacrifice. I no longer have to die, literally, for my own sin. 
But if we don't watch out, we take that so far that we act like death is no longer a part of our walk with God and death is a daily part of our walk with God. Not literal death in that I have to physically die for faith. But listen to what Paul says in Colossians 3, 5. He says, by the way, this is after Jesus died on the cross. This is after Jesus resurrected from the grave. This is after Pentecost when the Spirit of God fell on people. This is after the church was spread all over this, the region uh, there in the east. He says, put to, what's the word? Death. Therefore, what is earthly in you? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. You see, a living sacrifice is one who gets to live because of Christ, but then makes the choice to kill off that in you that needs to go away regularly, ongoing. John Piper says it best. He said, I hear countless testimonies of people struggling with sin. I'm ready to hear somebody talk about killing it. Killing it, destroying it, battling it, fighting it. Not just, man, I just have this one area that I can't get over and you guys love me and you're so filled with grace and so I just thank you that even though I'm in my 20s, I'm gonna die in my 80s with the same sin in my life and you're gonna love me anyway. That's not the Christian perspective. The Christian perspective says, Jesus died so I don't have to die, but the stuff in me that killed Jesus, I'm ready to kill it. I wanna kill it. When I'm struggling with this area of sin, I'm sick of it. I don't want it in my life anymore. And so we do the, the acts of worship, which is when I go to a friend, as I did in my life this week. I had lunch with a friend. He's a friend that does not go to church here. He's a friend that is another pastor. He's a friend that I trust. And I said, there's something in my life. It's been in my life too long. I don't want it in my life anymore. And I told him about it. Confessed it to him. And I told him what I was doing to deal with it, what I was doing to kill it. And he said, I'm going to ask you about it every two or three times a week for the, for the next year. I said, that's exactly what I need. I need you to take out your hatchet and I'll take out my hatchet. And together we're going to cut that out of my life. And, and if there's something in your life you need killed, man, hand me the knife. I'll help you. I know this is harsh language for some of you, but I need you to understand that, that we are worshiping God when we are killing away the parts of us that killed him. Getting those things as far from us as possible, which leads to kind of the next thought. If, if we're supposed to be a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1 and 2, as we move to Romans 12, 3, the scripture is going to teach us that a very important part of worship is humility. Not just humility, but the idea that Jesus is big and I am small. Jesus is big and I am small. Please, for just a moment, meditate on this thought. Think about it. When, you, when you're looking for a new church, are you looking for one that makes you small and Jesus big? Are you looking for one that fits all the needs for you, fulfills all of your expectations, makes sure and meets all those needs like everybody else is taking care of all the things you don't want to have to take care of. And in the long run, without even meaning to, we make us big and Jesus small. Humility, you want to really worship? We make Jesus big and us small. One of the most famous New Testament texts about this is John 3.30 that says, he must increase, I must decrease. He must increase, I must decrease. Would you guys say that out loud with me? He must increase. I must decrease. One more time. He must increase. I must decrease. That is worship. That's worship. It's I'm coming to be with a group of people who are going to love God as much as I love God, and they're going to help me think about myself less and think about him more. Trust myself less and trust him more. Entrust the outcomes of my life to myself less and entrust the outcomes of my life to him more. That's worship. That's worship. See, I can't get that from my recliner at home with my clicker watching Netflix sermons. Because that's me going, I want it my way. And my way is in pajamas and warm socks under an electric blanket without any stupid people to talk to. He must increase. I must decrease. 
The last thing I would just kind of throw at you today is this idea. A worship-filled church, this is a church that functions well to give glory to God. From the Romans passage, he says, Romans 12, 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Let us use them. Let us use them. We are to use the gifts that we have. Now, let's talk about this because the word use is a word that gets used in a lot of ways. Okay, like you don't want somebody in your life who's going to use you, right? Like that's a negative term. Like, like you just, if somebody were to say, Pastor Brad, I don't like you because all you do is use people. We would, that's, a, that's a condescending negative term, right? In that sense, that's a negative thought. In that sense, using people would be not caring about them, but just using them to get what you want, okay? So that's not the kind of use we're talking about. I'm not talking about the church using you as if the church is some separate organized body and you are not the church, you're an attender at the church. See, I think a lot of folks think, well, I'm not the church, I'm an attender at the church. And every time they ask me to serve, I feel like they're just trying to use me. No, let's, let's time out there because that, that's a mistaken thought. See, there's no such thing as the church separate from the people of the church. There's no, like, it, it, you know, like, like, there's no such thing. You are the church. You, that's the only definition there is. You are the church. See, like, quite frankly, uh, Mount Zion Baptist Church was not blown over by a tornado. A building they meet in was blown over by a tornado, but the church is there this morning right now, probably hearing a good sermon and excited right? That's, that's, that's the church. You are the church. So the church is not trying to use you. God is trying to use you as a part of his church. And by use you, it's not in, in, in a, in a non-valued, overlooked kind of way, but it's just the opposite. It's, do you know how valuable you are? I got to tell you, if I could speak out about anything right now, when it comes to church, it would be this. I am I don't want to appear angry. This is not angry. This is passionate, okay? But I am passionately sick and tired of the lie that makes people think that they are a lower class Christian citizen than their pastor or their deacon or their elder or their worship leader. Do you know how many times people have said in an introduction to me, they're like, hey, my name's Joe and I, 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 just, I just go to so-and-so church. I'm like, no, you don't just Go to so and so church. Because see, what they wanted, like the, around them were people going, Well, I'm the pastor of, I'm the worship leader of, I'm a deacon at, like those kinds of terms. All of a sudden, we start classing people in such a way that God does not class people like that at all. Like, I want you to understand something. The, the lost person that works next to you does not need to talk to your pastor. The lost person who works next to you needs to talk to you. You see what I'm saying? Like your child at eight, when they're ready to receive Christ and be baptized, I will talk to that child a thousand times, but ultimately that's to give you comfort because they don't need me. They need their daddy or their mommy to share the love of Jesus with them. It's so much more important than me checking off the boxes to make sure they answer the questions correctly. They need you. You're the believer in their life. You're the one with great opportunity and relationship and value. And you're the one that Jesus gifted for that exact moment. When I say that a a worshipful church is a church that functions well to bring God glory, what I'm saying is that it's a group of people, whether it's 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000. It's a group of people where the people are gifted by God, they know it, and they put them to use. Just like the scripture said there, so that God is being glorified in the way that the people of the church are serving him. And he even gives a list of some examples. If, you're, if, you, if you are prophetic, then, then have faith. If you are a server, then get off your behind. That's not literally what it says. It says, if you're a server, then serve. If you teach, then teach. If you exhort, then exhort. If you can contribute, then be generous. The one who leads, then lead with zeal. Got so excited, my watch is coming off. Uh, If you do acts of mercy, then do acts of mercy cheerfully. See, here's what I'm afraid of, folks. Here's what I'm just, if you could hear me very carefully, I'm afraid that someone has this exact excitement about serving. So they go and they say, hey, I want to serve. And somebody has a clipboard with a bunch of openings and they put a name on an opening 
And now that person's like, well, I'll do whatever. That's cool. But, but like my gift, my gift is, um, my gift is I'm a teacher or, or I, I think I can, I'm, I'm generous. I can contribute. And, and you, and you put me in a place where I need to do acts of mercy and I'm going to try, but that's not really, you know, it's not really my thing. And so six months in, you're like, I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> it's not that what you're doing is wrong or that you're trying wrongly, but it's that you're not connected with your, with your giftedness or your passion. It's not a bad way to start, by the way. Like, I'll do whatever I'm needed. Like, tell me what to do. I'll jump in. And then when you get there, you go, I love you and I love this, but it's not really my giftedness. So how about I move to that area? Because I think it is. I want to help there instead of helping here. Uh, th- that's, that's great. Here's what it doesn't say. And I want to just be so literal here. It doesn't say, for those of you who preach, preach. And for those of you who sing and play guitar, sing and play guitar. And for everybody else, enjoy your chair. That's not what it says. You know, and I mean that tongue in cheek. I'm not picking on anybody and I'm not pointing at anybody. I'm just, I think that's what the American church is becoming. Like that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. You either preach, play guitar, or work in the nursery and nobody else matters. And that is ridiculous. And that is not a church that worships. And their songs might be awesome. Sermons might be fantastic. God is not worshiped. Because God is worshiped in an environment where his people bring their giftedness to accomplish the tasks that he has set. And are preachers important? Well, of course, they help teach and they lead us and they guide us. Are worship leaders important? Of course they are. They bring us into corporate worship. But are those two things the most important things in the church? Absolutely not. Those two things are built up in order to spur you on to go be the church. And if, if they don't do that, if they don't do that, then, then they've lost their value. And so my encouragement today to you is to find your place to serve. If I could close out in saying a couple of things for you to think about, and I know this could pinch a little bit, but just hear me, okay? If you can serve and don't, then you're not worshiping. If you can give and you're not giving, then you are not worshiping. If you can care, but you don't care, then you're not worshiping. Even if you've attended a worship gathering hundreds of times, God is worshiped by a fully functioning church where its members are regularly contributing to what God wants to do through it. Nowhere does the Bible say, to the one who sits and watches while others function, enjoy your seat. It never says that. It never says that. So, I love you, church, and God loves you, and I want each of us to continue to grow in our worship, to grow in the way we relate to the Lord, to grow in the way that we encounter Him together as a people, and I encourage you today to worship God, to worship Him. Would you pray with me for a moment? Lord, we take this moment to consider you and your callings in our lives. We take this moment, Lord, to trust you, to be reminded that you love us and we love you. We take this moment, Lord, to reconsider our own worship. Lord, I love the songs that we sing. I love the scriptures, obviously, that we read and the sermons that we get to hear or that I get to deliver. But I love you more than so much all of that put together. I love you because of what I know you've done in my heart, what I know you've done in my life, what I know you did for my sin. I love you because I've seen you change the hearts of people. I love you because I've seen you save the the grossest, most angry of sinners. I've seen you redeem the one who at first didn't even think they needed you or wouldn't even admit that you existed. Lord, I've seen you soften the most hard heart. And I know that you created this world in which we live and you are redeeming it for your own glory and for our joy. And so I pray that you'd help us consider The truth is, Lord, I will confess to you 
some of our church's shortcomings, some of our church's sin. Lord, we've not always been quick to serve or quick to help. There are times when we've chosen, for whatever reason, to let a need go by and not fill it. There have been a lot of us, Lord, who probably by virtue of past teaching and expectation, but maybe even something worse than that, who've let our gifts go unused for years at a time. Lord, we may have even, we may have been stopped short of even knowing what our gifts are. We may feel uh, un, not useful to you, Lord. And so we haven't even considered or looked into who we are, or what we're called to do. Father, I, I ask that you would forgive us for that, but, but that you would spur us on to service. Lord, another area where we have sinned is we've not always been as generous as we should be. We've bought ourselves things and then claimed that we had no way to give to you. We've prioritized our wants over your callings in our life. And some, although Lord, have been extremely generous, but, but there have been others uh, who struggle with that. I know in my life as a young man, it was a very hard practice to begin to think about sharing with your kingdom and with your gospel things that at that time in my life I thought were mine. Thank you, Lord, for showing me that anything and everything that's owned by me is yours because I'm owned by you. So, Lord, I pray that you would increase our generosity and our trust and our willingness to serve you and love you and worship you in that way. Lord, we confess to you this morning that some of us have held on to past bitterness far too long. We were wounded by a church that maybe handled something wrongly, a pastor, a deacon, a leader that, that handled themselves out of line possibly, or, or maybe we were not in the, in the, maybe they weren't in the wrong at all. Maybe we just did not like being confronted. And we've held that, we've held on to that. And because of that, Lord, we've let our commitment and our connection to the local church be lighthearted at best. We've lived life with the church at arm's length, keeping them at a distance so that they could not hurt us like we felt like we had been hurt before. Father, that is sin. We confess that. That is fear is what that is. And we confess it to you. We confess our bitterness, our fear, our anger, our anxiety to you, Lord. We ask you to heal all of those things so that we might be a people who function worshipfully, bringing our giftedness to the table every week, looking for ways to serve you, not only in and around our other church folks, but throughout the week and throughout our lives. Forgive our sin today and spur us on to spirit-filled living. Jesus, we trust you with this. In your name we pray. Amen. Ushers, would you join us down front? I know that sometimes we do an altar call and sometimes we just kind of let people think. I feel like today is a day when this isn't, this isn't something we just go to an altar and pray about. You know, this is, we're talking about the kinds of things that we go home and make a decision about how we're going to interact with the church and, and God's people and with the Lord in our worship. And so I don't want to let us off easy by saying, just come and pray about it. You'll feel better. You know, I, I, I want to send us out of here, maybe even a little uncomfortable thinking, okay, what is it that God's calling me to do? Before you give today, I want to tell you one thing. Um, our leadership team is meeting today and we're doing so because uh, we, we have, as you know, we've been searching for a children's pastor for a while. Uh, I'm blown away, you guys, I'm blown away with the potential. Um, the quality of people who have applied uh, and the opportunity to do this. This is, this is really, really big. But we're also dealing with the challenge of whether or not we can afford to do what every one of us think is right. And so we're walking through our meeting today going, okay, well, we know we need to do that. So what are we going to cut? 
What are we going to get rid of? We'll be asking the question, would our people love their children extremely well taken care of or breakfast every Sunday? Because we might have to pick one over the other. See what I'm saying? Um, will our people, do our people want to serve our children or do we want to do fireworks every 4th of July? Because we might have to decide between the two. Those are the kinds of decisions that we're making. Now, I believe this because I believe our leadership team can make great decisions and we can make sure that we accomplish what God's calling us to do. But I also want to be honest with you and say that currently there will be some significant sacrifices to pull that off. So before we start doing that as a church, I want to ask you, looking in your own life, I, I have literally no ounce of idea who gives what here. I have no clue. I want to ask you if you are making the sacrifices in your individual life that you need to be making. Because we don't want to make our church have to do big picture sacrifices that affect all people because a small portion of our crowd is not making the sacrifices they're supposed to make in their own individual lives to be part of what God's calling us to do. I hope that's loving. That, that is intended with all love in my heart as you think about that. It's not meant to motivate a big offering today. That's not it. It's meant to make sure that we are all realizing our own value and realizing what God's calling us to do and making sure that whether it's serving, teaching, loving, helping, giving, whatever it is, that, that we're all in. Because that's a worshipful church. That's a worshipful church. Would you pray as we ask God to bless this offering and multiply it and do amazing things with it. Jesus, we trust you. I ask that you would help us to have the best biblical mindset about what worship looks like in our own life. Father, help us to value one another more. Help us to value the gathering, the, 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 the assembly, the ecclesia, the church more. Lord, we trust you with this. And we're going to follow you today. We're going to be obedient to you today. We're going to respond with faith today. Thank you for the grace that gives us the power to do any of it. In your name we pray. Amen.